This is COVID-19. Kinda. This is the full DNA sequence of COVID-19. 11 pages, single-spaced. I downloaded it from the NIH website. Everything you need to make COVID-19 is in this code. This is the literal instruction set on how to make the virus. Somewhere inside this mess of letters is the information we need to make a COVID vaccine. So we should find it as soon as possible because I'm lonely and I don't want to sit in this room anymore. Hi. My name is Frank. I'm a 32-year-old man with my own room, and today we're going to discuss the Moderna vaccine, which is the American vaccine that's the furthest along. There's a bunch of different vaccines being tested, but we're talking about the mRNA vaccine, because whenever you hear about the vaccine in the news, it's probably the mRNA vaccine, because that's the one that's the furthest along. So what does that mean? Well, I'm assuming that you know what a vaccine is, and then mRNA stands for messenger RNA, which for our purposes is just another word for DNA. So the vaccine is virus DNA that we're injecting into our bodies. But before you let that scare you, remember... DNA is just an instruction set for how to build different biological materials. So the virus DNA is just instructions on how to build the virus particle. So if we want to understand the DNA that's in the vaccine, first we have to understand what the virus particle actually is. So what is the virus? The virus is a little fatty capsule, a little hollow ball made out of fat molecules, and it's got spikes all over it and a single copy of this DNA instruction set floating around inside it. That's it. That's the virus. It's just a little DNA container. <laughs> but just like any other DNA-based life form, its goal is to make copies of itself. I swipe at dating apps, the virus puts people on ventilators. Both equally romantic reproductive strategies, and actually more similar than you might think they are. Me and the virus have something in common. Neither of us can reproduce on our own. We need a partner, so to say. Some microscopic organisms, like say bacteria, can make copies of themselves just by splitting in two. As long as bacteria has enough food and energy, they can just split and split and split and split and reproduce all day long. The virus cannot do this. It's just a weird little plastic bag with spikes on the outside and DNA inside. It doesn't have the cellular machinery necessary to make copies of its own DNA. DNA can't just copy itself. It needs a vocab word, ribosome, to take in the DNA instructions and spit out the corresponding stuff. Bacteria have ribosomes, so bacteria can make infinite copies of its own DNA all day long, as long as they have enough energy. Viruses don't have ribosomes. So they have to invade another cell and use their hijacked ribosomes to build new copies of the virus. They're like little cellular parasites. So once the virus has hijacked a ribosome, what do those DNA instructions actually build? Good question. The COVID particle is not very complicated. In the world of DNA, this is not a lot of code. A full sequence of my human DNA would be 1,033,000 pages. So 11 pages is child's play. People like to compare COVID to the 1918 flu, but like we barely even knew what DNA was in 1918. And now we can like spit in a tube, stick it in one of these $20,000 machines and pop out a full sequence of the virus DNA to print out and peruse at our leisure. But in case you aren't fluent in DNA, I've highlighted some of the uh, important parts. All right, so let's pull some of these things out. Each highlighted bit builds a different part of the COVID particle. This part is the fatty container. 
this part, like a full page, is the spike. And then finally, the rest of it, it makes a full copy of the full instruction set, assembles it all into a new COVID particle, and then repeats that process thousands of times. Uh, millions? Hundreds? I don't know how many COVID particles fit into a single cell. A lot, probably. It, like, it doesn't until the infected cell is full to the brim and then like it, ex it explodes, I think. All these new COVID particles are now free to float around and go find new cells to infect. So let's follow one and see what happens when it gets out in, into the world. So let's follow the story of a single COVID particle from the very beginning. Hypothetically, let's say there's a hypothetical person named Carly who works at a hypothetical fancy grocery store where a hypothetical rude customer pulls their mask down to ask her where the fancy cheeses are. A COVID particle suspended in their hypothetical spit floats through the air and into the mouth of Carly. Now that virus particle needs to find some ribosomes, which are inside of Carly's cells. Carly's cells are protected by cell membranes, cellular walls that don't just let any random stuff in and out of the cell. Luckily for us, the virus is covered in handy dandy spike proteins, AKA the spike. <laughs> That's the spike. 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 Artists love to draw the spike. Everybody loves the spike. The problem with the spike, for us, is that thanks to friggin' randomly generated evolution, the COVID spike is the perfect shape to attach to the cell membrane of human lung cells. Like I said, lucky us. It grabs onto the membrane, and then it squirts the virus DNA into Carly's lung cell. It's not good, and it's gross, and it's ruining 2020. Once inside, that DNA is free to float around the inside of Carly's cells until it finds a ribosome and then starts building a whole new army of COVID particles. That's not good. But Carly's body isn't just going to lay down and let the virus take over. She's got an entire army of white blood cells ready to spring into action. It's time to talk about the immune response to COVID-19. This is the captain. Red alert. Red alert. Enemy vessel. Deep cloaking. Go to red alert. Fire phasers. Fire phasers. Red alert. Your immune system is insanely complicated. So I'm going to skip pretty much the whole thing and call it all white blood cells. White blood cells fight the intruders that get into your body Everybody remembers that from like third grade. Well, it turns out there are many, many different kinds of white blood cells and they all have different jobs. Some of them are like bouncers that float through your body, constantly checking the ID of every single thing that they come in contact with. Your body cells, you know, like your skin cells, your hair cells, your lung cells, everything that makes up your body all have an ID molecule called the major histocompatibility complex. You don't have to remember that. But this thing, it acts like a molecular ID card that all of your cells display on the outside of their cell membrane. And that's how the white blood cells know what is the body and what is an intruder. The bouncer white blood cells are floating around like, ID please, ID please, ID please. It's everything they come in contact with. Eventually, they will eventually bump into a COVID particle who doesn't have the ID card. And this sets off like a whole thing. At this point, the bouncers will basically call in reinforcements and start eating as many COVID particles as they can, like literally eating them. They absorb them and break them down. But it's a slow process because they can only find the COVID particles by checking every single person's ID 
one by one. And at this point, the virus is probably replicating faster than the bouncers can keep up with. They need to call in the special forces. They need antibodies. This is the captain. Fire phasers. Fire phasers. Red alert. Go to red alert. Red alert. Who here has heard the word antibody 10,000 times, but doesn't actually know what antibodies are? Yeah! Antibodies are little molecules, you know, chemical molecules. H2O is a chemical molecule. Antibodies, chemical molecules, very simple. But antibodies are molecules that are the perfect chemical shape to fit like a puzzle piece over the COVID spike. And the match is so perfect that they'll basically like snap onto each other like little magnets. Your white blood cells can produce antibodies by the trillion, a billion. Again, I don't know the number, a lot. They flood your entire system, and whenever an antibody gets near a COVID spike, it snaps on, covers it up, and like nerfs it. So now the question is, how does your body make antibodies that are the perfect match to COVID-19? That's the big question. This is like the main question. <laughs> Refreshing way of looking at it. But if we swing back here, maybe down near the front. Hi, I actually have two questions for Mr. Gates. Uh, the first is, have you ever been pantsed as an adult? And then my second question is, how do our white blood cells make antibodies for a virus that they've never seen before? Your bone marrow, the inside of your bones, is white blood cell HQ. This is where you make new white blood cells and also where the white blood cell archive is. The white blood cell archive is filled with memory T cells and memory B cells. More vocab words. T cells are like the white blood cell generals and B cells are the antibody factories. But each B cell and T cell, they work together. They only make antibodies for one specific disease. Like, this is the measles antibody factory, the chicken pox antibody factory, last year's flu antibody factory, times a thousand or a million. I, I don't know, again, I don't know the number. Every intruder your body has ever come in contact with, there's a memory B cell and a memory T cell hanging out in the archive, ready to fire up at a moment's notice, flood your system with that specific antibody. This is what natural immunity is. Everybody knows you only get chicken pox one time. Like, this is why. It's because there's a memory B cell and a memory C cell for chicken pox just waiting to fire up at any second. But COVID-19 is a brand new disease. So out of all the thousands of memory B cells in the archive, not a single one matches the COVID spike. That means HQ gets to build a brand new antibody factory. And guess how it does that? Literal random guessing. White blood cell HQ generates new B cells literally at random until it ends up with a perfect match for the COVID spike. That's right. We're going to brute force this password. It's like finding a combination lock on the side of the road and then opening it by tr just trying every single number starting with zero 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 one and remember this whole time while we're working on the combination lock the bouncers are back at the front lines getting overwhelmed by covid while hq is like you know zero 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 one zero 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 two zero 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 three zero 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 four this is gonna work eventually how long does this process usually take you may ask I don't know, like a week, two weeks, longer? How long are people sick with COVID? Like, I don't know, everybody's different. You think our immune systems would have figured out a better way to do this by now. The random guessing is not doing it for us. I mean, they, they figured it out eventually, but come on guys, you're up against the clock here. It's a real shame that they can only do the antibody discovery during a COVID infection. Wait, hold on. <laughs> What if we didn't do it at the same time? What if we learned how to make the antibodies before the virus infected us? Is that possible?
<laughs> yes, it's called a vaccine. Let's look at the virus DNA one more time. Part one, make the fatty container. Part two, make the spike. Part three, assemble and then replicate to infinity until you kill everyone on the planet. Does one of these things sound worse than the other two? The dangerous thing about the virus is the replication. The spike and the container are not dangerous by themselves. You could inject yourself with a billion spikes and nothing bad would happen. Your body would just flush them out. As long as they're not replicating themselves, it's fine. This brings us to the big idea behind the vaccine. The harmful thing is the replication, but the thing your white blood cells design antibodies against is the spike. Two separate parts of the DNA. Just get rid of the replication. Keep the spike. We don't need the container. Keep the spike. The spike is not dangerous by itself. So what if we just injected ourselves with the spike? Is that possible? Yes, this is what a vaccine is. Through the magic of science, we can inject ourselves with just the spike. And we actually have two different ways of doing it. One way is to grow the spike in a lab. You know, we've got the instructions, inject the instructions into like a bacteria in a petri dish. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but it's like probably a bacteria. And then you wait for them to start spitting out spikes. Scoop up the spikes, inject the spikes into people's shoulders, and then uh, let your body get to work. That would work. But the only problem with that is that manufacturing the spikes in the petri dish is actually harder than it sounds. And uh, we have to make like 7 billion doses of this thing. Strategy number two is to skip the petri dish. So we're going to take the spike instructions and inject those straight into people's shoulders. The spike instructions will find their ways into a cell and then your cells will produce the spike on their own, right? So your body is producing just the spike and then your white blood cells will find it and then figure out how to make antibodies against it. That is the big idea behind the mRNA vaccines like the Moderna vaccine, like the Pfizer vaccine, like a bunch of the vaccines. We're taking just the spike DNA and like getting it into our cells they produce the spike, the white blood cells figure out how to make antibodies against the spike. Congratulations. You now officially understand how the vaccine works in theory. So let's return to the original question. Should I be scared of the vaccine? No. At least not in theory. In theory, it's just going to make the stupid little spike one time. It has no way of replicating itself. My white blood cells will flush it out with antibodies. And then I've got the antibodies. <laughs> It sounds great, in theory, but we're not done yet because there's a small chance that everything we've learned so far is completely fake, made-up nonsense. We still have to run a real-world experiment and see if this stuff actually works. It's called a clinical trial. Remember when I said medicine is like 80% unknown unknowns? Actually, I think that was an older version of the script. Well, medicine is like 80% unknown unknowns. No matter how well you think you understand all the mechanics, there are always unknown unknowns. Why did my grandma survive five heart attacks late into her 80s, but my seventh grade gym teacher dropped dead from the same thing at 26? No one knows. The human body is a mystery. My point is, it may seem like we know a lot about this stuff, but we don't. Promising drugs fail literally all the time. Scientists constantly think that they've got some new drug figured out in the lab, and then they inject it into people, and nothing happens. Everything about the vaccine makes sense in theory, but we still have to test it in people. It's literally the only way to know if it actually works. Injecting experimental substances into people, lesson number one. Everything is poison. This is the first thing they teach you at clinical trial school. 
Everything is poison. Tylenol is poison. Vitamin C is poison. Water is poison. The COVID vaccine is poison. Everything is poison. It's all about the dose. For example, one glass of water, great. 100 glasses of water will kill you. The same thing goes for drugs. Two pills of Tylenol, great. 20 pills will destroy your liver. It's all the dose. How do you know the proper dose of something if you've literally never injected it into people before? This is like the hardest question in uh, clinical trials. Scary, scary, scary. We've been mixing up all our chemicals and our little petri dishes, and now it's time to inject this thing into a real person with a family. But how do you know the dose? Like, we only know that 20 pills of Tylenol is bad because somebody took 20 pills of Tylenol. For this new vaccine, we don't know how much is going to be too much. So typically, you'd start with an animal trial, where you inject your experimental substance into poor little animals and see what happens. But in the case of the COVID vaccine, they basically skipped that part. But don't worry, that's not as bad as it sounds, actually. Animal trials, like, barely even correlate to people, so... I don't know, I, I, most people say it's better than nothing, but like, no one takes animal trials very seriously. With or without them, you still have to be careful when you, you know, move into people. They did inject the Moderna vaccine into like, three monkeys, and like, they were fine. But you know, like, who cares? Like, it doesn't change how we structure phase one. Clinical trials are split into three phases. The point of phase one is to get your drug into people without killing them, and you figure out the right dose. The positive effects of drugs tend to like plateau at a certain point, but the side effects will, you know, get worse and worse until like they kill people. So I'm gonna draw you a little graph. All right, so here's my fun little graph. On this axis, we've got the dose, so the amount of drug that we're gonna give people, and then here's the effect that that drug has. The green line is going to be the good effects, so what we want the drug to do. And then the red line is going to be the bad effects, the side effects, until, you know, all the way up to death. Every different drug is going to have, like, a different curve, but they all kind of, like, look roughly like this, right? So the, the good effects, you know, they're real low with the real low doses, and then eventually they'll start to go up and up and up, and good things are happening, good things are happening, but then it kind of levels off. The positive effect of any drug is going to look, you know, something like this, right? At some point, you're going to start to get diminishing returns. Now let's look at the bad things. The bad effects usually kind of look like this, right? Everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. It's starting to get some side effects, some side effects, some side effects, some side effects. Whoa! Dead, you know. Death happens somewhere up here. So part of our phase one study is we're going to try different spots on the chart with different doses and then start to chart out, you know, these two different effects. We're trying to find this part of the graph. This is the therapeutic window, it's called. We're giving enough drug for the good things to start to happen, but we're not giving so much where we start to get diminishing returns, but where the side effects are continuing to go up. So we're trying to find the dose that is somewhere here. Every drug in existence kind of looks like this for the good stuff, and it kind of looks like this for the bad stuff, right? But we don't know where these lines are, right? For example, a bad drug that probably wouldn't even get out of phase one, right? Their chart, a bad drug's chart would look like this, right? The red line would be here, and it, like the bad stuff is happening before we even get to the therapeutic window. That's bad. Those drugs get rejected. We're hoping that the chart for the vaccine looks like this, right? Where the good things are happening before the bad things are happening. For the Moderna vaccine, phase one is already done. So let's look at what they did. They tested out three different doses, 25, 100, and 250 micrograms. So we're giving each dose to 15 people. Remember, phase one is a pretty small study. Our main purpose here is just to get this thing into people for the first time without killing anybody. Right, so we're only doing 15 people with each dose. Plus we're staggering it, right? So up first, four people got the small dose. 
This is the scariest part. This is the first time this has ever been inside anybody, right? If anybody's gonna die, it's gonna be this this first one. They waited a couple days and to make sure those first four people were okay, and then they move on to the medium dose. You give the medium dose to four people, wait a couple days, they're fine. Then they went back to the small dose and filled out the rest of the group, the rest of the 15. Those extra 11 people, all fine too. Now let's fill out the medium dose. They're all fine. Now let's add the booster shots. A lot of these COVID vaccines are actually two doses. So they gave 25 and then they waited 30 days, or actually like 28 days, 29 days. They waited like a month and then gave another 25 to everybody. They're fine. Add the booster to the 100. They're all fine. Now let's move on to the big dose, right, the 250. This is 10x the original dose. This is kind of dangerous too. So just like before, let's start with four people. The first four people were okay, so they filled it out, plus the booster. So everybody in the large group was fine, but all of them reported some kind of like noticeable side effect, right? So like, and one of them even had like 103 degree fever after the uh, the booster shot, I think. So this 250 is probably the upper limit of uh, what kind of dose we want to give people. So this side effect data is the, the red line on our chart. The large dose, the 250 was, you know, somewhere here, you know, we're, we're starting to get fevers. We're starting to have side effects. We probably want to keep it below the 250. The 250 is somewhere here, the 100 and the 25 were down here, you know, people's arms hurt, uh, that was about it. There weren't really any major side effects for the, the small or the medium dose. So we're down here, the 250 is like somewhere here. Now we get to talk about the exciting part, the green line. The thing we're trying to do with the COVID vaccine is induce people's white blood cells into producing the spike antibody. So, the big question, this is like the drum roll question, did the vaccine make the antibody? Yes! It did. Hooray, yes, confetti, woo, all right. The small dose, 25 micrograms, produced 391,000 units of antibodies. Like, I'm not a doctor, I don't know what those units mean. The medium dose produced 781,000 units of antibodies. And then the big dose produced 1.3 million antibodies. Is this good? Uh, we don't know how many antibodies we need, so, uh, well, I guess we can check how many, like, actual sick people, how many antibodies do they make when they get the real virus. Let's check that. The real virus induces 142,000 units of antibodies. That means even our lowest dose of the vaccine can actually induce more antibodies than the real virus. That's really, really good. All right, put a point on this. Let's summarize. We took the spike instructions, we injected them into people's arms, and then they made the, the COVID antibody. Like, this is dope. When these results first came out, you started seeing Fauci, like, get really excited. We are cautiously optimistic that this will be successful because in the early studies in human, the phase one study, it clearly showed that individuals who were vaccinated mounted a neutralizing antibody response that was at least comparable and in many respects better than what we see in convalescent serum from individuals who have recovered from COVID-19. That's what it looks like when the scientists uh, get really excited. Anyway, moving on. We know that we can make the antibodies. That's great. We're really cooking with gas now. But don't pop the champagne just yet. We still have to figure out if those antibodies are protective. That means, do the antibodies actually stop people from getting sick with COVID? That's still an open question. The immune response to the real virus appears to be protective, meaning once you get sick with COVID, it doesn't seem like you can get it again. And then even if you do, it's like not as bad. 
that protection appears to be coming from the spike antibodies. But remember, unknown unknowns. There can always be unknown unknowns. It's possible that something is happening with the immune response to the real virus that science is unaware of. So there's still a chance that the spike antibodies alone actually won't be protective. That's why we have phase three. We need to figure out if the vaccine is protective. You may be wondering what happened to phase two. We're still doing phase two, but we also kind of skipped it. Technically, we're doing two and three at the same time. Let me explain something about phase two in a vaccine trial. It's kind of redundant. Phase two in a drug trial is very important because in a drug trial, you're developing a drug to give to sick people. Phase one in a drug trial is with healthy people, and then phase two in a drug trial is with sick people. So phase two is really important. In a vaccine trial, everyone is healthy. So it ends up being that phase two and phase three for vaccines are kind of the same thing. You wouldn't normally do it this way. But just like with the animal trials, we're up against the clock here. Phase two is kind of redundant anyway, so this is fine. And while we're on the subject of animal trials again, I think you guys know how I feel about animal trials, but the whole point of the animals is to protect people in phase one. And if you remember, we didn't hurt anybody in phase one. So there you go. Phase three is the big phase. This is when we inject tens of thousands of people and then uh, we follow them to see if the vaccine actually prevents anyone from getting COVID in the real world. That's the question now. We know we can induce the antibodies, but are the antibodies actually protective? pretty complicated to test because uh, we know the vaccine is working when nothing happens. Like the vaccine working is me getting the vaccine and then not getting COVID. Was it the vaccine working or was did I just never come in contact with COVID? Like it's hard to test the negative, you know? One way to do this test is called a human challenge trial, which is Basically the same thing we did to those poor little monkeys in phase one, or before phase one. You basically, you give people the vaccine and then you spritz them with COVID, like squirt it in their face or something, and see if they get sick. They probably like inject it, but whatever, it's funnier to spritz monkeys with COVID. Anyway, scientists don't like to do human challenge trials because scientists are a uh, squeamish people and they don't want to spritz people with COVID, something about like liability or ethics or something. That doesn't change the fact that someone has to expose these volunteers to COVID. Like the only way to test a vaccine is to expose people with the vaccine to the virus and see if they get sick. There's no way around it. Somebody has to expose these people to COVID. So the scientists figured out a way to pawn off this responsibility onto the rest of the world using fancy statistics, which we will discuss now. Here's what you do. Recruit a giant mass of volunteers, AKA human guinea pigs. I think they got like a $50 Amazon gift card or something. I tried to sign up, but they never called me back. In this case, the Moderna trial has 30,000 people participating. Half get the 100 microgram dose of the vaccine, plus a booster a month later, just like the phase one. And then the other half get a placebo. And uh, it's important that the guinea pigs don't know which one they got because you don't want them to alter their normal behavior. The goal here is for these two groups to be as similar as possible. As soon as one group starts acting differently from the other group, <laughs> ruins the experiment. And it's not only behavior, all the different demographic factors, they matter too. For example, imagine if all the old people 
out of the 30,000 ended up in the placebo group, and all the young people were in the vaccine group. That data would come back and say, like, look, the vaccine group had no serious cases, and the placebo group had, like, all these deaths. Wow, the vaccine must, must be working incredibly. Or maybe it was just the age difference. There's no way to know. So once again, the experiment's ruined. That's why the random assignment is so important. It assures that every demographic factor that you could ever think of is being evenly distributed between the two groups. Plus, in this case, we've got tens of thousands of participants, which makes the random assignment, like, even more effective. So, we can safely assume that our vaccine group and our placebo group are experimentally the same. The random assignment and the large numbers of people means that we can assume that these two groups are essentially the same. Remember our hypothetical friend Carly from the grocery store? Well, she's actually not hypothetical. She's one of the guinea pigs in Boston. So let's check in. So the study is blinded, um, and it's actually double blind, meaning that all of our participants are not aware if they're receiving vaccine or placebo, and all of the study personnel also, and especially the company that makes the vaccine, are not aware who's receiving vaccine or, or placebo um, until the point at which the study is unblinded. And that's scheduled to be two years from now when the study would be scheduled to be completed, but it could be earlier if this, the vaccine is found to become found to be definitely effective by the external board. They wouldn't let her film the needle going into her arm or even look at it with her eyes because they were afraid that it might unblind the study somehow. But she did get it. You'll just have to trust me. Now the fun part. We get to wait. Everybody gets to wait. The scientists were not brave enough to intentionally expose Carly to COVID. But that does not change the fact that someone has to expose Carly to COVID. Luckily, she actually does work in a grocery store. That's probably why they picked her to be in the study. Because all day every day, She's constantly yelled at by thousands of different NPR moms buying fancy cheese. So it's only a matter of time before someone exposes Carly to COVID. So let's do some quick napkin math. With the current infection rates in the US, uh, when I was writing the script, which was like the end of August, there should be about 15 cases a month in a group of 15,000 random people. I do think they specifically picked people for the trial who were at higher risk of being exposed. So like, let's be generous and double it and call it 30 cases a month. The placebo group, the placebo group, actually I think it was over here. The placebo group was injected with sugar water. So we should see all of those expected 30 cases a month show up in the placebo group. The vaccine group is the same as the placebo group, except obviously they got the vaccine. For every case that shows up in the placebo group, we should expect to see a case in the vaccine group. Are you following along? This is a very important concept. For every case that shows up in the placebo group, we can assume that someone in the vaccine group was at least exposed to the virus. Did they get sick? We'll find out. For example, if the vaccine doesn't work, this whole thing was a dud, the vaccine doesn't work at all, these two groups will have the same number of cases. If the vaccine does work, the vaccine group will obviously have fewer cases. This whole operation, everything we've been talking about for this whole video, comes down to these two numbers. The top number of the fraction is the number of cases in the vaccine group. The bottom number of the fraction is the number of cases in the placebo group. The farther apart these numbers are, the better the vaccine is working. Like I said before, now we wait. We wait for cases to start showing up in these two groups. Yes, 30,000 people may sound like a lot of people, but when it comes to efficacy, that number doesn't actually matter. The only people that matter are the ones in the fraction, the people who were actually exposed to the virus. As long as I didn't mess up my napkin math, that's only like 30 cases a month, or maybe even less. My point is, this takes time. In the meantime, we get to talk about politics. I've done an hour about vaccine with no politics, so, uh, I don't know. We gotta do politics. How big does the fraction have to be before we know if the vaccine works? The FDA has set the threshold of success for the trial at 50% plus or minus 20. That means 
they want proof that the vaccine works at least 50% of the time with big enough numbers to be sure that the actual number is no lower than 30. You've probably heard the, the phrase confidence interval before. That's the plus or minus 20% part of this. The basic idea being that the more data we have, the more confident we can be that the results are not just a random fluke. So we find ourselves in this situation where the longer the trial runs, the more confident we can be in the results. Here's my wild speculation. I'm not a doctor, I'm a filmmaker, I'm allowed to wildly speculate. 50% plus or minus 20 seems like a pretty low bar to me. I'm willing to wildly speculate that the trial will probably clear that bar relatively quickly. Plus, I have to imagine that Trump is gonna try to pressure the FDA into approving the vaccine like right before the election, and at that point, the placebo group will probably have only like 30 cases. I, I, I wrote this script like two weeks ago. He, he already did it. He, he's already trying to pressure the FDA. He's tweeting, he's tweeting up a storm. We'll see what happens. But the important thing to know is to keep your eye on the fraction. The fraction is everything. When the data comes out, you have to think to yourself, are the numbers in this fraction actually enough to convince me that the vaccine works? One last point, because I think I'm being a little misleading here. When I talk about the fraction, I'm talking about testing for efficacy. Does the vaccine work or not? There's another question of safety. And when we're talking about safety, 15,000 people is a lot of people. There are almost two different trials happening here. To test if the vaccine works, you have to expose people. To test if the vaccine is safe, you only have to stick it in people's arms. You don't have to worry about whether or not they're exposed to the virus because they're going to get side effects just from the injection. So the safety side of this is well covered. The efficacy side is what I'm kind of like half criticizing with all the fraction talk. I haven't talked about safety that much because honestly, I'm not worried about it. We would have seen short-term side effects by now, and long-term side effects for a one-time injection of a non-replicating substance, that's like not a thing. Long-term side effects are a thing when you take lots of doses of something over a long period of time. Like if you're on some kind of heart medication for 20 years, yes, you'll see side effects at year 20 that you didn't see at year one. But the idea that you'll get two doses of vaccine and then have some weird side effect lying in wait that only shows up years down the road, that's like crazy. I'm sure someone in the comments will have some bizarro example of something that happened in like 1972 to like five people or whatever, but those are exactly that. Bizarro. The lightning strikes of the medical world. Are you going to spend your time prepping for lightning strikes or are you going to go put the fire out that's like burning down your house? Now I should say, again, I'm not a doctor and you'll never hear an official person say what I just said in like a definitive way. That's because official people only say definitive things after they have definitive data. So you're not going to hear official statements declaring anything about long-term safety. Luckily, I'm not an official person, so I can tell you, it's fine. If you're scared of the long-term effects of vaccines, stop driving on the highway, stop riding roller coasters, stop going in the ocean. In fact, you better never leave your bedroom again because the world is a much too dangerous place for you constantly worrying about being struck by lightning. The virus is killing more people than 9-11 every like two or three days. I don't want to talk about lightning strikes. All right, that's the end of the video. Bye.